Scarlet Letter, Chapter 1, The Prison Door A throng of bearded men in sad-colored garments and gray steeple-crowned hats, intermixed with women, some wearing hoods and others bareheaded, was assembled in front of a wooden edifice, the door of which was heavily timbered with oak and studded with iron spikes. The founders of the new colony, whatever utopia of human virtue and happiness they might originally project, have invariably recognized it among their earliest practical necessities to allot a portion of the virgin soil as a cemetery, and another portion as the site of a prison. In accordance with this rule, it may safely be assumed that the forefathers of Boston had built the first prison house somewhere in the vicinity of Cornhill, almost as seasonably as they marked out the first burial ground on Isaac jo Johnson's lot and round about his grave, which subsequently became the nucleus of all the congregated sepulchers in the old churchyard of King's Chapel. Certain it is that some 15 or 20 years after the settlement of the town, the wooden jail was already marked with weather stains and other indications of age, which gave a yet darker aspect to its beetle-browed and gloomy front. The rust on the ponderous ironwork of its oaken door looked more antique than anything else in the new world. Like all that pertains to crime, it seemed never to have known a youthful era. Before this ugly edifice, and between it and the wheel tracks of the street, was a grass plot, much overgrown with burdock, pigweed, apple pern, and such unsightly vegetation which evidently found something congenial in the soil that had so early borne the black flower of civilized society, a prison. But on one side of the portal, and rooted almost at the threshold, was a wild rose bush covered in this month of June with its del delicate gems, which might be imagined to offer their fragrance and fra fragile beauty to the prisoner as he went in, and to the condemned criminal as he came forth to his doom, in token that the deep heart of nature could pity and be kind to him. This rose bush, by a strange chance, has been kept alive in history. But whether it had merely survived out of the stern old wilderness so long after the fall of the gigantic pines and oaks that originally overshadowed it, or whether, as there is far authority for believing, it sprung up under the footsteps of the sainted Anne Hutchison as she entered the prison door, we shall not take upon us to determine. Finding it so directly on the threshold of our narrative, which is now about to issue from this, that inauspicious portal, we can hardly do otherwise than pluck one of its flowers and present it to the reader. It may serve, let us hope, to symbolize some sweet moral blossom that may be found along the track, or relieve the darkening close of a tale of human frailty and sorrow. Chapter 2. The Marketplace the grass plot before the jail, in Prison Lane, on a certain summer morning not less than two centuries ago, was occupied by a pretty large number of the inhabitants of Boston, all with their eyes intently fastened on the iron-clamped oaken doors. Amongst any other population, or at a later period in the history of New England, the grim rigidity that petrified the bearded physiognomies of these good people would have augured some awful business in hand. It could have betokened nothing short of the anticipated execution of some rioted culprit on whom the sentence of a legal tribunal had but confirmed the verdict of public sentiment. But, in that early severity of the Puritan character, an inference of this kind could not be so indubitably be drawn. It might be that a sluggish bond servant or an undutiful child whom his parents had given over to the civil authority was to be corrected at the whipping post. It might be an antinomian, a Quaker, or other heterodox religionist, was to be scourged out of town, or an idle or vagrant Indian whom the white man's firewater had made riotous about the streets was to be driven with stripes into the shadow of the forest. It might be, too, that a witch, like old Mistress Hibbins, the bitter-tempered widow of the magistrate, was to die upon the gallows. In either case, there was very much in the same solemnity of demeanor on the part of the spectators, as befitted a people among whom religion and law were almost identical, and in whose character both were so thoroughly interfused that the mildest and severest acts of public discipline were alike made venerable and awful. Meager, indeed, and cold was the sympathy that a transgressor might look for from such bystanders at the scaffold. On the other hand, a penalty which, in our days, would infer a degree of mocking infamy and ridicule might then be invested with almost as stern a dignity as the punishment of death itself. It was a circumstance to be noted on the summer morning when our story begins its course that the women, of whom there were several in the crowd, appeared to take a peculiar interest in whatever penal infliction might be expected to ensue. The age had not so much refinement that any sense of impropriety restrained the wearers of petticoat and farthingale from stepping forth into the public ways, and wedging their not unsubstantial persons, if occasion were, into the throng nearest to the scaffold at an execution. Morally, as well as materially, there was a coarser fiber in those wives and maidens of old English birth and breeding than in their fair descendants, separated from them by a series of six or seven generations, 
For throughout that chain of ancestry, each successive mother had transmitted to her child a fainter bloom, a more delicate and briefer beauty, and a slightly physical frame, if not character of less force and solidity than her own. The women who were now standing about the prison door stood within less than half a century of the period when the man like Elizabeth had been the not altogether unsuitable representative of the sex. They were her countrywomen, and the beef and ale of their native land, with a moral diet not a whit more refined, entered largely into their composition. The bright morning sun, therefore, shone on broad shoulders and well-developed busts, and on round and ruddy cheeks that had ripened in the far-off island, and had hardly yet grown paler or thinner in the atmosphere of New England. There was, moreover, a boldness and rotundity of speech among these matrons, as most of them seemed to be, that would startle us at the present day, whether in respect to its purport or its volume of tone. Good wives, said a hard-featured dame of fifty, I'll tell you a piece of my mind. It would be greatly for the public behoof if we women, being of mature age and church members in good repute, shall have the handling of such malefactresses as this Hester Prynne. What think ye, gossips? If the hussy stood up for judgment before us five that are now here in a knot together, would she come off with such a sentence as the worshipful magistrates have awarded? Mary, I trow not. People say, said another, that the Reverend Master Dimsdale, her godly pastor, takes it very grievously, grievously to heart that such a scandal should have come to, upon his congregation. The magistrates are God-fearing gentlemen, but merciful overmuch, that is a truth, added a third autumnal matron. At the very least, they should have put a, the brand of hot iron on Hester Prynne's forehead. Madam Hester would have winced at that, I warrant me. But she, the naughty baggage, little will she care what they put upon the bodice of her gown. Why, look you, she may cover it with a bro brooch or such heathenist adornment. And so walk the streets as brave as ever. Ah, uh, but, interposed more softly a young wife holding a child by the hand, let her cover the mark as she will. The pang of it will always be in her heart. What do we talk of marks and brands, whether on the bodice of her gown or the flesh of her forehead, cried another female, the ugliest as well as the most pitiless of these self-constituted judges. This woman has brought shame upon us all and ought to die. Is there not law for it? Truly there is both in the scripture and the stature book. statute book. Then let the magistrates who have made it of no effect thank themselves if their own wives and daughters go astray. Mercy on us, good wife, exclaimed a man in the crowd. Is there no virtue in women save what springs from a wholesome fear of the gallows? Those is the hardest word, that is the hardest word yet. Hush now, gossips, for the lock is turning in the prison door, and here comes Mistress Prynne herself. The door of the jail being flung open from within, there appeared in the first place, like a black shadow emerging into sunshine, the grim and grisly presence of the town beetle, with a sword by his side and his staff of office in his hand. This personage prefigured and represented in his aspect the whole dismal severity of the Puritanic code of law, which it was his business to administer in its final and closest application to the offender. Stretching forth the official staff in his left hand, he laid his right upon the shoulder of a young woman, whom he thus drew forward, until on the threshold of the prison door she repelled him by an action marked with natural dignity and force of character, and stepped into the open air as if, it, as if by her own free will. She bore in her arms a child, a baby of some three months old, who winked and turned aside its little face from the too vivid light of day, because its existence heretofore had brought it acquaintance only with the gray twilight of a dungeon or other darksome apartment of the prison. When the young woman, the mother of this child, stood fully revealed before the crowd, it seemed to be her first impulse to clasp the infant closer to her bosom, not so much by an impulse of motherly affection as that she might thereby conceal a certain token, which was wrought or fastened into her dress. In a moment, however, wisely judging that one token of her shame would but poorly serve to hide another, she took the baby on her arm, and with a burning blush and yet a haughty smile and a glance that would not be abashed, looked around at her townspeople and neighbors. On the breast of her gown, in fine red cloth, surrounded with an elaborate embroidery and fantastic flourishes of gold thread, appeared the letter A. It was so artistically done, and with so much fertility and gorgeous luxuriance of fancy, that it had all the effect of a lasting and fitting decoration to the apparel which she wore, and which was of a splendor in accordance with the taste of the age, but greatly beyond what was allowed by the sumptuary regulations of the colony. The young woman was tall, with a figure of perfect elegance on a large scale. She had dark and abundant hair, so glossy that it threw off the sunshine with a gleam, and a face which, besides being beautiful from regularity of feature and richness of complexion, had the impressiveness belonging to a marked brow and deep black eyes. 
She was ladylike, too, after the manner of the feminine gentility of those days, characterized by a certain state and dignity, rather than by the delicate, evanescent, and indescribable grace which is now recognized as its indication. And never had Hester Pern appeared more ladylike in the antique interpretation of the term than as she issued from the prison. Those who had before known her and had expected to behold her dimmed and obscured by a disastrous cloud were astonished and even startled to perceive how her beauty shone out and made a halo of the misfortune and ignominy in which she was enveloped. It may be true that, to a sensitive observer, there was something exquisitely painful in it. Her attire, which indeed she had wrought for the occasion in prison and had modeled much after her own fancy, seemed to express the attitude of her spirit, the desperate recklessness of her mood, by its wild and picturesque peculiarity. But the point which drew all eyes, and as it were, transfigured the wearer so that both men and women who had been familiarly acquainted with Hester Pern were now impressed as if they beheld her for the first time, was that scarlet letter, so fantastically embroidered, embroidered and illuminated upon her bosom. It had the effect of a spell, taking her out of the ordinary relations with humanity and enclosing her in a sphere by herself. She hath good skill at her needle, that's certain, remarked one of the female spectators. But did ever a woman before this brazen hussy contrive such a way of showing it? Why, gossips, what is it but to laugh in the faces of our godly magistrates and to make pride out of what they, worthy gentlemen, meant as a punishment? It were well, muttered the most iron-visaged of the old dames, if we stripped Madame Hester's rich gown off her dainty shoulders, and as for the red letter which she has stitched so curiously, I'll bestow a rag of mine own rheumatic flannel to make a fitter one. Oh, peace, neighbors, peace, whispered their youngest companion. Do not let her hear you. Not a stitch in that embroidered letter, but she has felt it in her heart. The grim beetle now made a gesture with his staff. Make way, good people, make way, in the king's name, cried he. Open a passage, and I promise ye, Mistress Pern will, shall be set where man, woman, and child may have a fair sight of her brave apparel from this time till an hour past meridian. A blessing on the righteous colony of the Massachusetts, where iniquity is dragged out into the sunshine. Come along, Madam Hester, and show your scarlet letter in the marketplace. A lane was forthwith opened through the crowd of spectators, preceded by the beetle and attended by an irregular procession of stern-browed men and unkindly visaged women. Hester Prynne set forth toward the place appointed for her punishment. A crowd of eager and curious schoolboys, understanding little of the matter at hand except that it gave them a half holiday, ran before her progress, turning their heads continually to stare into her face and at the winking baby in her arms and the, at the ignominious letter on her breast. It was no great distance in those days from the prison door to the marketplace. Measured by the prisoner's experience, however, it might be reckoned a journey of some length. For haughty as her demeanor was, she perchance underwent an agony from every footstep of those that thronged to see her, as if her heart had been flung into the street for all of them to spurn and trample upon. In our nature, however, there is a provision, alike marvelous and merciful, that a sufferer should never know the intensity of what he endures by its pres present torture, but chiefly by the pain that rankles after it. With almost a serene deportment, therefore, Hester Prynne passed through this portion of her ordeal and came to a sort of scaffold at the western extremity of the marketplace. It stood nearly beneath the eaves of Boston's earliest church and appeared to be a fixture there. In fact, this scaffold con constituted a portion of the penal machine, which now, for two or three generations past, has been merely historical and traditionary among us, but was held in the old time to be as effectual an agent in the promotion of good citizenship as ever was the guillotine among the terrorists of France. It was, in short, the platform of the pillory, and above it rose the framework of that instrument of discipline, so fashioned as to confine the human head in its tight grasp, and thus hold it up to the public gaze. The very ideal of ignominy was embodied and made manifest in this contrivance of wood and iron. There can be no outrage, methinks, against our common nature, whatever be the delinquencies of the individual, no outrage more flagrant than to forbid the culprit to hide his face for shame, as it was the essence of this punishment to do. In Hester Prynne's instance, however, as not unfrequently in other cases, her sentence bore that she should stand a certain time upon the platform, but without undergoing that gripe about the neck and confinement of the head, the proneness to which, this, which was the most devilish characteristic of this ugly engine. Knowing well her part, she ascended a flight of wooden steps and was thus displayed to the surrounding multitude at about a height of a man's shoulders above the street. 
Had there been a papist among the crowd of Puritans, he might have seen in this beautiful woman, so picturesque in her attire and mien, and with the infant at her bosom, an object to remind him of the divine maternity, which so many illustrious painters have vied with one another to represent. Something which should remind him, indeed, but only by contrast of that sacred image of sinless motherhood, whose infant was to redeem the world. Here there was a taint of deepest sin in the most sacred quality of human life, working such effect that the world was only the darker for this woman's beauty, and the more lost for the infant that she had borne. The scene was not without a mixture of awe, such as much must always invest the spectacle of guilt and shame in a fellow creature, before society shall have grown corrupt enough to smile, instead of shuddering at it. The witnesses of Hester Prynne's disgrace had not yet passed beyond their simplicity. They were stern enough to look upon her death, had that been the sentence, without a murmur at its severity, but none, but had none of the heartlessness of another social state, which would find only a theme for jest in an exhibition like the present. Even had there been a disposition to turn the matter into ridicule, it must have been repressed and overpowered by the solemn presence of men no less dignified than the governor and several of his counselors, a judge, a general, and the ministers of the town, all of whom sat or stood in a balcony of the meeting house, looking down upon the platform. When such personages could constitute a part of the spectacle without risking the majesty or reverence of rank and office, it was safely to be inferred that the infliction of a legal sentence would have an earnest and effectual meaning. Accordingly, the crowd was somber and grave. The unhappy culprit sustained herself as best a woman might, under the heavy weight of a thousand unrelenting eyes, all fastened upon her and concentrated at her bosom. It was almost intolerable to be born. Of an impulsive and passionate nature, she had fortified herself to encounter the stings and venomous stabs of public contumely, wrecking itself in every variety of insult. But there was a quality so much more terrible in the solemn mood of the popular mind that she longed rather to behold all those rigid countenances contorted with scornful merriment and herself the object. Had a roar of laughter burst from the multitude, each man, each woman, each little shrill-voiced child contributing their individual parts, Hester Prynne might have repaid them all with a bitter and disdainful smile. But under the leaden infliction which it was her doom to endure, she felt at moments as if she must needs shriek out with the full power of her lungs and cast herself from the scaffold down upon the ground, or else go mad at once. Yet there were intervals when the whole scene, in which she was the most conspicuous object, seemed to vanish from her eyes, or at least glimmered indistinctly before them, like a mass of imperfectly shaped and spectral images. Her mind, and especially her memory, was preternaturally active, and kept bringing up other scenes at this roughly hewn street of a little town, on the edge of the western wilderness. Other faces than were lowered upon her from beneath the brims of those steeple-crowned hats. Reminiscences, the most trifling and immaterial, passages of infancy and school days, sports, childish quarrels, and the little domestic traits of her maiden years came swimming, swarming back upon her, intermingled with recollections of whatever was gravest in her subsequent life. One picture precisely as vivid as another, as if all were of similar importance or all alike a play. Possibly it was an instinctive device of her spirit to relieve itself by the exhibition of these phantasmagorical forms from the cruel weight and hardness of the reality. Be that as it might, the scaffold of the pillory was a point of view that re revealed to Hester Prynne the entire track along which she had been treading since her happy infancy. Standing on that miserable eminence, she saw again her native village in Old England and her paternal home, a decayed house of gray stone with a poverty-stricken aspect, but retaining a half-obliterated shield of arms over the portal in token of ancient gentility. She saw her father's face with its bold brow and reverent white beard that flowed over the old-fashioned Elizabethan ruff, her mother's, too, with the look of heedful and anxious love which had always wore in her remembrance and which, even since her death, had so often laid the impediment of a gentle remonstrance in her daughter's pathway. She saw her own face glowing with girlish beauty and illuminating all the interior of the dusky mirror in which she had been wont to gaze at it. Then she beheld another countenance, of a man well stricken in years, a pale, thin, scholar-like visage, with eyes dim and bleared by the lamplight that had served them to pore over many ponderous books. Yet those same blurred optics had a strange penetrating power, when it was their owner's purpose to read the human soul. This figure of the study in cloister, as Hester Prynne's womanly fancy failed not to recall, was slightly deformed, with the left shoulder a trifle higher than the right. Next rose before her in memory's picture gallery the intricate and narrow thoroughfares, the tall gray houses, the huge cathedrals, and the public edifices, ancient in date and quaint in architecture, of a continental city, 
where new life had awaited her, still in connection with the misshapen scholar. A new life, but feeding itself on time-worn materials, like a tuft of green moss on a crumbling wall. Lastly, in lieu of these shifting scenes, came back the rude marketplace of the Puritan settlement, with all the townspeople assembled, and leveling their stern regards at Hester Prynne, yes, at herself, who stood on the scaffold of the pillory, an infant at her arm, and the letter A in scarlet, fantastically embroidered with gold thread upon her bosom. Could it be true? She clutched the child so fiercely to her breast that it sent forth a cry. She turned her eyes downward at the scarlet letter, and even touched it with her finger to assure herself that the infant and the shame were real. Yes, these were her realities. All else had vanished. <laughs>